find yourself in grad school, you might have come across this video and you're an undergrad or you're in community college or you're a high school student and you've always had a dream of being a professor at a university. This video is for you. Hey friends, welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Dr. Danielle Lawson, also known as The Balanced Academic. I'm an assistant professor at Penn State University and I bring you academia lifestyle content. Today, I'm starting video one of my new series on how to navigate the academic job market and land a tenure track position even post COVID. I know that that might seem like it's a little bit impossible. Everything you hear nowadays is that the tenure track is pretty much impossible to find a job on, particularly in a post COVID world. And while that might be true, there are still ways to set yourself up for success. And so today I'm gonna cover those based on my experiences as someone who got their job during COVID. The 30,000 foot view of the academic job market that I'm gonna give you here, combined with the tips and tricks and things to keep in mind, can be helpful at all stages of your career. They really are things that I wish I had known on day one of my doctoral program. And so I'm hoping to extend that to you today to kind of tell you a little bit of the things that I have learned and how to navigate it or just how to prepare yourself to effectively navigate it and make a informed decision about whether or not you want to be a tenure track assistant professor. So first and foremost, why me? Why am I bringing you this information? Like I mentioned at the beginning of this, I am an assistant professor who is on the tenure track at a large research institution, Penn State. When I got my job offer at Penn State, it was not my first time in the academic market. It was also not my first time being extended an offer to work as an assistant professor at an institution. I've been on the market twice, first in 2019 and then in 2020. In 2019, I received a few offers as well as multiple interviews. And then in 2020, I had multiple interviews and my offer came through right before the hiring freezes really became ubiquitous across academic institutions. So I'm hoping to cobble together the things that I have learned over the past few years on the market, combined with the tips and tricks that have been extended to me through multiples of generations of academics before me, and bring them to you to just kind of help demystify the process, because in a lot of ways, it's kind of held within the ivory walls of the academic institution. Like I mentioned at the beginning, this is video one, an entire series on how to navigate the market and land yourself that dream assistant professor job. So today, it's going to be this 30,000 foot view of things to keep in mind generally before making that decision that yes, this is the year that I'm going to tackle the academic market and what you need to do to put yourself in a place where you leave feeling like you gave it everything you got and if it doesn't work out, that there's something else meant for you. So before we get started, let's talk about the state of the academic job market. And before I can even talk about the state of it, what do I mean by the academic job market? Well. The academic job market is really the jobs that come out on an annual basis that result in working at an academic institution. They can include tenure track professor jobs, it can include non-tenure track faculty, it can include postdoc positions, research associates, librarians, you name it. But this video is really going to be targeted at tenure and non-tenure track faculty as well as postdoctoral positions. So let's jump into the state of the market and probably the most depressing part of the video admittedly. Why do people say that it's so competitive? Before COVID, we found ourselves in a position where we were producing more and more PhDs but that didn't mean that there were those same number of opportunities and people wanted to be professors. Those opportunities weren't coming up because in a lot of ways, people aren't aging out of the system. And so what I mean by that is professors will do their jobs, they love their jobs, and they're gonna stay in until they absolutely do not want to work anymore. So that also means they may not be retiring at the typical retirement age. And as that happens, you just don't have jobs that are opening up. Before COVID, there had been a consistent decrease in funding both federally and at a state level for academic positions. It can be a little bit different for private institutions, but generally speaking, there's just been a decrease in funding. With decreases in funding come cutbacks in the number of positions that are offered, and it also comes with an increased demand of what they expect one professor to do compared to what they might have expected them to do in the past. This makes the market incredibly competitive. What may have resulted in your current professors or advisors getting a job when they got hired 10, 15 plus years ago, it's gonna be very different now. There's a greater requirement of 
publications, grant funding, and evidence of being an effective teacher and engaging in university and global service. So this is all to say that skills really do matter to be able to get the position. But it's also important to mention that luck and timing play a huge role in the market. But just know that it's not all about how good you are. There's a lot of luck involved. Anyone who tells you differently is lying. Now in a post-COVID world, how have things changed? We're seeing the exact same issues that I mentioned previously, but now they're exacerbated. There is much less funding. A lot of universities have had to cut their budgets significantly. And because of that, they're gonna be even fewer positions. Additionally, now people are finding themselves competing with not only people who are entering the market for the first time, but people who have lost their jobs the previous year or people who were extended offers and then lost their offers and had them pulled because of hiring freezes. So what this means is that we just have a lot of people who are available to do these jobs and we don't have those available jobs to put these people in. And so because of that, we see a lot of people starting to turn to all academic positions, so non-tenure track, non-academic positions, and finding ways to use their skills that they've learned as a PhD student in a different way. So even though it is competitive, it's not that you're never gonna find a job, but it's important to know and to be realistic that the market is really competitive and it is really, really tight and hard to actually land that position. So you find yourself watching this video and you're like, well, Danielle, I still wanna give it a try. You never know what's gonna happen. Absolutely, I tell anyone who wants to go for it to absolutely go for it. Even when I was on the market, I wasn't 100% sure that being a professor was what I wanted, mostly because I was trying to be realistic. So now that the depressing stuff is out of the way, let's dive in on just some general tips that you need to know about the market. First and foremost, timing. When do these jobs come out? How often do they come out? What does that look like? The market really runs very parallel to when people would apply for graduate student positions. So think about it generally being from about July every year to April. There can be definitely some idiosyncrasies and differences at individual institutional levels, but generally speaking, the market runs from July to April. So what happens and in what order does it happen? First, you're gonna see job announcements starting to come out and they're gonna come out at varying speeds. Sometimes they're gonna come out and you have months to apply. Sometimes they're gonna come out and they've got a rolling deadline and they want people applying that very next day. The second thing that happens is you have to put together your application packet as well as continue to network. So during this time, after those announcements have come out, people are really working on refining their packets, what they're actually using to apply. And I'm gonna talk about what the packet includes here in a second. The third thing that happens is after you've submitted your packet, a search committee gets together and begins to extend initial interviews to their pool of candidates. So they take that entire pool, which at times is hundreds of people, and they narrow it down. Typically, they're narrowing it down to about six to 10, five to 10 candidates. It really depends on that search committee. These initial interviews are typically over the phone or over Zoom. They can take both forms, and they are typically with that entire search committee. Once they've interviewed all of their initial candidates, they then pare down that pool to an even smaller pool. And that's usually about three to four candidates. But once again, things can vary. And those are the candidates that they're going to extend on campus interviews to. During COVID and potentially during this next season of the market here in 2021, we're probably gonna see some of those on-campus visits happen over Zoom due to COVID still changing and we don't really know what's happening from day to day as to how safe it is for us to travel and be in person face-to-face -face with new individuals. Those on-campus interviews can last anywhere from a day to three days. And during those interviews, you'll have multiple meetings with people from other faculty to upper administration, you will usually give a research talk. Sometimes you'll even have to teach, but that will all happen in those few days. So as you can imagine, it's a pretty packed schedule. You typically will never know who the other candidates are. Most of the time universities will hold this very close to them and it is actually illegal for them to announce who the other candidates were. And once they've gotten through all of those candidates, which may take a month or two, depending on the context, then they go through the process of trying to eliminate who they think that is not gonna work for them and who they might think works for them. And they'll rank them all the way down from that top recommendation to the bottom. It's a search committee who does this, usually with feedback from the departmental faculty. And that search committee will give that to the department head 
And the department head will move through the system, taking it to higher administration. Once you've gotten all approvals, they will then extend an offer, typically by phone, to their top candidate. And this is where negotiation starts. As you can imagine, this can go back and forth for a while. Some people will accept immediately, but most people are gonna negotiate. And then sometimes their first choice won't take the offer. And that's why they rank people, because if their first choice doesn't take it, they still want someone else that they can offer it to. And so it might take you months before you hear back with an offer, and that's okay. So that's usually why I say to give it until about April of the following year to hear back. But once you get an offer, think of it as the fact that you've gotten an offer. It doesn't matter if you were their first choice or their third choice, you've gotten an offer and that's amazing. And now that you understand a little bit more about the timing of the academic job market each year, let's talk a little bit about the different types of institutions you can apply to. There are three main categories, research institutions, teaching institutions, and then liberal arts institutions. It's important to know a little bit about each of these institutions because that's gonna determine what your job is going to look like if you were extended an offer as an assistant professor. Research positions are exactly what they sound like. That means the focus for most professors is on research. The majority of their job is about producing research, bringing in grant funds, and producing manuscripts, as well as typically training the next generation of graduate students. Now, this is not to say that they don't teach or that they don't do service probably 90% of professors engage in that to some extent, but it's gonna vary based on the institution. Next, teaching institutions. Just like the research institution, this means that there's a focus on teaching. There's gonna be a decreased focus on research, publications, and you may not even mentor grad students depending on what that university structure is like. And then finally, liberal arts institutions. And liberal arts institutions typically are the combination of both teaching and research institutions, but there is typically a very high um, expectation to be very good at mentoring because having this holistic experience tends to be a hallmark of a liberal arts institution. Like I said, it's important to know about these things because you don't want to apply to an institution that you would hate working at. Do you hate research? Do you hate publishing? you probably shouldn't apply to a research institution. Do you love teaching or do you hate teaching? That will then determine whether you wanna to apply to a teaching institution or not. And then the same thing will go with liberal arts institutions. So it's just things to keep in mind as you begin navigating the job announcements that come out. So you might be like, okay, Danielle, I know where I wanna apply. I know that I want to work at X institution. Where do I find those announcements? They come out in a variety of places. Typical websites like Indeed, LinkedIn, you'll find them there. You're also gonna find them on social media sites, Twitter, Facebook, you name it, those announcements will be there. You're also gonna find them through any professional organizations that you're a part of. And the great thing about professional organization websites is that those jobs tend to be very specific to that professional organization. So if you are a PhD in psychology and you want to work a psychology position, being a part of some of those organizations, like the American Psychological Association, for example, might give you some of those positions that you're looking for specifically, and they may not be advertised in other places. And then last, but certainly not least, are academic job boards. Higher ed jobs, The Chronicle, those are just a few examples. They have their own academic job boards that are just specifically for academic positions. Once you've found an announcement, you're gonna have a list at the end of what you need to submit for your packet. And it can include a variety of things, but generally speaking, you should expect to have to submit a cover letter, recent curriculum vita, potentially a variety of statements, so think research statement, teaching statement or philosophy, and diversity statement, as well as potentially writing samples. Typically, these are gonna be manuscripts that you've published, and at times, although rare, already submitting letters of recommendation. Most jobs, that won't be the case, but I have seen them come across. So what happens once you put this packet together? It's that you edit, edit, edit again, and also practice. Lean on people like your mentoring network, your advisors, academic consultants, editors even. You want me to make sure that what you are putting forth is your best effort in these packets. Then, once you get an interview, practice becomes your best friend knowing what this institution is like, who works there, their research area, all of that's gonna become critically important. But the other tough part is that you don't wanna stop doing what you're already doing. You wanna continue adding lines to your CV and bringing that updated CV with you whenever you go to an interview. 
you don't want to stop doing what you're doing. And so that can be a little bit hard to juggle when you're looking for a job and also maintaining your scholarship. Editing Danielle popping in here. My camera didn't record some of my wrapping up of the video. So you're gonna see me pop in here, wrap it up, and then you're gonna see me jump to another clip that has different lighting. That's what happened. So that was a 30,000 foot view of the academic job market, what to expect to have to think about and how to navigate it. I also wanna make sure that I let you know of how I can help you through my side hustle at Accepted Consulting. At Accepted, I work as their head of postdoctoral development and tenure track positions, and I'm here to help you through all of it. I can help you look through those statements that you have to write, those cover letters, and make sure that you are getting yourself in a place that you are putting your best foot forward. Additionally, I can help fill in when you feel like you've got so much that you need edited and your advisors can't keep up. That happened to me, so I wanna provide that service to you all. Another resource that's available to you through Accepted's website is a new workbook of how to write the perfect cover letter for an academic job. I'm gonna put the link to that workbook in the description below. It is a minimal fee that you have to pay to get access to it, and it will walk you through each individual paragraph, so that way, hopefully, when you have your first draft, it's a really strong draft already. And then finally, I have started a free masterclass series through Accepted Consulting's website. It is how to navigate the academic job market post COVID-19 in much more depth. Like I said, it's completely free. The next one's gonna be offered on July 17th, 2021 at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can go to Accepted's website to find the link to sign up, and I will also put the information in the description below. In the meantime, I hope this was a really helpful first video to talk about the academic job market overall. You're gonna have some videos coming up about each of those parts of the job packet, ways to nail your interviews, and much, much more. So hold tight, keep your eye on my channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, definitely hit the subscribe button and click the bell for post notifications. That way you know when I post the following videos in this series. In the meantime, I look forward to hearing from you and I hope to see you at that masterclass on Sunday. Bye.